afternoon. My name is Kevin Jorgensen. I'm the director of dairy programs at East Central Select Sires. And on behalf of everyone at Select Sires, we uh, couldn't be pleased, more pleased to, uh, to welcome you to Mystic Valley Dairy this afternoon. And, and uh, um, the first person I'd like to thank for us putting this together today is actually not someone from Select Sires, but Tom Brunig from SCR. Um, he offered the opportunity uh, that maybe we should nominate Mitch as a virtual tour, and uh, it was an excellent idea um, about the heat time system, which you'll hear a little more about in terms of the improvements to the facilities later in the presentation today. But I wanted to throw out a special thank you to him because uh, uh, I wouldn't have thought of that until he brought it up. And it made such perfect sense to me from the respect that over the past decade, there's probably not been one farm from Select Sires more visited by our international guests here at World Dairy Expo than Mystic Valley Dairy. The difference is that for a lot of us domestically, we hadn't given the same opportunity for you here in the States to, to visit the dairy. So the opportunity for us today is to see the farm. And I apologize in advance. Some of my videos are being a little sketchy here today. But I will work through that. And, uh, but certainly, it, it, uh, I think you'll enjoy hearing from Mitch today about the dairy. It's also equally kind of a double-edged sword for me today to, uh, to be able to be the person to introduce Mitch today. Because not only am I a consultant on the dairy along with several others, but Mitch and I have been friends for a very long time. And as this presentation is about genetics today, uh, Mitch and I have known each other for about 25 years. And one of the classes we had in college was a genetics class that we had to use a simulated program to find cows and then take sons of those and make the next generation and couldn't get the inbreeding too high. And, and we kind of knocked that project out of the park and kind of realized that we had very, very similar thoughts. And here now, 20-some years later, not only do I have the opportunity to work with Mitch on the dairy and that stuff, but we're also partners on, on a lot of the cattle that you'll see this afternoon. And I couldn't ask for a better partner uh, to be in that situation. So it, it's equally uh, exciting for me to introduce to you today uh, Mitch Brunig from Mystic Valley Dairy. I'm going to turn it over to Mitch. Uh, if you have questions this afternoon, please raise your hand. I'll come over with a microphone and allow you to do that. So if you would, uh, give a nice round of applause for Mitch Brunig. I guess I have this handy dandy mic here, so I don't need the uh, other one. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's kind of funny. Dairy Expo uh, at our farm, we're about 30 minutes from here, usually ends up having, we, we don't ever get to Dairy Expo because it's too far away. And what happens is people from around the world come to our farm. So it's kind of cool to be here and, and show you what we do on a, on a daily basis. Um, the other thing I was going to say, we should treat the meeting room a lot more like Lambeau Field than church. So this is a really good seat at Lambeau Field. So I think if you want to come up and uh, move to the front, that'd be a great idea. Um, this is my family. Uh, my wife is actually home sick in bed today. So I told her to watch on TV, so maybe she's watching on TV. Um, the other people I want to introduce, and I don't have a picture of them, uh, and I should, but I don't. Uh, my mother is over here in the, the row. And then uh, Marty, my brother, is on the other side in the purple shirt. And then uh, Craig and Juan and uh, Craig's wife, Diane, are also up here. And one of the things about our farm is it's we. And so everything we do is it's not one person's success. We all work together and try and be a team. And so that's really, really important. So uh, whenever something's positive, you know, we like it to be positive together. Uh, so anyway, we're going to move on. Our farm was started in 1961 by my mom and dad in t traditional Wisconsin dairy farm. We had a uh, 50 stall barn, and apparently, you know, it's a, like a lot of free stall barns nowadays, 50 stalls, so you, you got to milk more than 50 stalls, right? So I think my whole life I remember shifting cows, and so we also had a free stall barn way back when, shifted the cows in and out. Usually we'd get to 100, and uh, you know, 
one of the things that my dad did a long time was sell cows to other farms, and that's something we're going to talk about later, but we've continued to do that, and we learned that from him. Um, we started having registered Holsteins. I think my dad had, you know, in the 70s, uh, had a couple. Cindy Ladd, I think, was one of the first cows he had. That was a registered cow, and she lived to be about 15 years old. We always remember her. She's kind of itty-bitty, but she lived forever. And uh, so that was where we started that. But in the 80s, um, some of you guys that know us remember the Vera cow, so we bought Vera. He went to a uh, sale. The Weeses down from Monroe, and I know there's Weeses in Monroe are like Brinigs in Sauk City, so I'm not quite sure which farm it was, but we bought Vera. And that was sort of the change to having registered genetics on her farm. And uh, she was a good cow. I remember that uh, she was a cow, though, that was kind of narrow and um, had a really good udder. And eh, she, she just needed a little special care. She was always kind of a cow that, she wasn't the strongest cow, but she was really, really a nice cow. So um, we expanded our dairy to, in 1998. And we extend, expanded to uh, a 400 cow dairy. Uh, we're still that size today. We've chose to concentrate on doing the very best with the, that size as opposed to expanding and adding more cows. Uh, one of the things that we always talk about is know who you are, and that's who we are, and that's who we want to be, and so that's what we're doing. Um, and then my brother came back to the farm in 2006, and he's been there uh, ever since, uh, and we'll talk about that later. So current herd statistics, uh, 33,000 is a rolling herd average. Um, we're really proud of that. Uh, we really like to uh, get a lot of milk from our cows, but we like to do it healthy. We like to have cows that last a long time. Uh, I think the last time Kevin did the math, we uh, have 20 cows in our herd right now that are producing uh, 200,000 lifetime. And so for you international people, uh, 80,000 kilo in their life. Uh, we got several cows that have calved for six, seven, and eight times. And in a freestyle barn, especially if you roll back to 15 years ago, uh, you know, cows are supposed to live a year and a half. So we didn't really like that model. That's not the model that we wanted to, to follow. And we've really worked on building our facility to have cows that are going to last. Um, we just classified recently, and our BAA is 106.6. And for those of you that follow what a BAA is, it basically takes the uh, how your animals compare to the average age for a score for that age. So um, 106.6. There's some herds that are 113, you know, that are really, really, really good. But however, if you take our herd side, which is 300 cows that are classified, uh, it's in the top 10. And I'm kind of hoping when it, in December they publish this every year, I'm kind of hoping we're going to be third or fourth. So we'll see how that ends up. So, so we really want cows to produce, but we also want cows that look good because we kind of are trying to do two things at once. Um, cows are milked three times a day. We have a double 10 parlor. We have seven full-time employees. 800 acres of cropland. We grow uh, corn, alfalfa, wheat, soybeans. Uh, kind of working on doing some more double cropping now. We're trying to grow some uh, cover crops. We're growing some radishes to try and help soil health. Uh, work on rotation and doing those kinds of things. So that's sort of our cropping rotation. Uh, so b back to key employees. Uh, Marty does calves and heifers. He also does some of the FSA stuff and the cropping uh, planning. Craig uh, does crops and machinery and cleans yards, and he'll tell me all the stuff he does because he does a lot. <laughs> and Juan takes care of feeding, and Juan sort of backs me up in the barn, uh, helping with taking care of herd health. If we have any shots to give, if we have fresh cows and stuff, you know, we always talk about how they're doing. And, and so, again, we all work together on all those things. Uh, and then, you know, Again, back to the we part of what we do. Um, these are very important people to our farm. Uh, James Bailey is our nutritionist, very good friend of mine. We, uh, I really trust James, and we, we really challenge each other to sort of figure out how we're going to take, e take things to the next level. And, and uh, so we just have a lot of fun working together. Dr. Pertzborn is our veterinarian from Lodi Vet Care. He's actually unable to be here today because he's in Germany on a family trip, so I um, guess you'll have to watch it on video. And uh, Dr. Nate Dorhorst also works for uh, Lodi Vet, and he is uh, 
does the embryo transfer that we do. And they also do, um, have started to do IVF transfer at the Lodi Vet Care. So, and then Matt Lang is here today. Uh, we just started working with Matt here this year, and he's our business consultant. So we work with them on trying to pr improve the business side of our business, uh, how we do financially. And we really, uh, really enjoyed working with Matt. I think he's a very valuable addition to our team. And of course, Kevin, all the good ideas we have are mine, and the bad ideas are his. Okay, genetics, I guess our, our virtual tour is about genetics, so we're, we're going to focus on genetics. Uh, we're looking for a combination of high type and production. So I want a cow that can milk 150 pounds of milk, and you can throw a halter on her and take her to the fair. Like, that's my perfect cow. And uh, I used to say I wanted a cow that classifies 85, and I think, yeah, you know what, I'm going to raise my standards. I really want a cow that can classify excellent. I, I just really think that's what we're striving for. We sell a lot of cows out of the barn. The number one reason that someone buys a cow from our farm, it's not the cow that milks 120 pounds of the broken down udder and bad feet and legs. It's the good cow. That's the cow that they want to buy. They'll pay me more money for that cow, and they'll take her home, and they'll be, I'll, I'll sell a cow that I'll make some money on, and they're going to take a cow home that they're going to be profitable. And it's really, it has to be synergistic that way. I can't sell a cow that somebody else can't make money on because that's, how we make money in this business when we market cattle. So the current sires that we're using, and this is kind of a, a list that has had more bulls on it recently as the genomic area has come upon us. And so we used to kind of say we wanted to use six bulls, and we wanted to make 50 daughters of those bulls so we had consistency through our herd, and we could breed that next generation of cows. Well, as you can see, the list has gotten a little longer. But Atwood, Guthrie, Gabor, Hero, Observer, I don't have to read it to you guys can read. Uh, and I guess you'll see that it's a heavy select sires emphasis. Um, we work with select sires because they sort of have the same goals that we do, and so it's just been a very good partnership. We do use other bulls from other studs. There was a bull toy story that we used, and I think he was a pretty good bull, so um, it's kind of a joke. <laughs> but we did, you know, that was a bull that we use, but we do other, use other bulls. In fact, uh, Alta Meteor is a bull that we're using right now, a planet sun from Shadow May that's at Alta Genetics. Uh, back to the, the goal of having 50 daughters of a bull, and we were really consistent at doing that. We had 50 Durhams, we had 50 Blitzes. We had, uh, I think we're milking, and have on the herd 47 or so Sanchez's and millions, Alexander, uh, Toy Story and Lou, our own bulls. And then uh, sires that we have, Guthrie, Crown, Durable, Hero. Uh, we didn't use a lot of Goldwyn. Goldwyn is an expensive bull. And uh, it was just hard to sort of figure out how to use him in a system where you were you know, breeding just regular cows. And so we flushed to him a little bit. But we went back and we're using the Goldwyn Sons. And, and we really like the results so far that we've had. And, and uh, you know, there's some people talk about Goldwyn's and freestyle barns don't do so well. Um, if, if they got enough strength and you have a system that's set up I think they're going to be just fine, and, and uh, we're actually really happy with the ones that we have. Uh, proven to genomic, we're about 66 to 33, and that number sort of varies uh, on a particular mating. It seems like if we have an animal that's out of a genomic, we'll probably breed her back to genomic, kind of take that run with those. And the proven ones, back to the proven ones. One of the things that we, we're not big on, uh, bulls that crash, and so we're still kind of slowly treading into the, the genomic world and learning how to use it to uh, go forward. And it's just one of those things, one of the things we'll say, and it, it'll probably sound like sour grapes, but we're pretty sure that our zip code has a 200 negative factor on the genomic mating because we can send in a mating that should be really good and it's always below parent average. It's just really frustrating. So, but. We just, you know, you keep trying, and, and that's, what, that's what genetics is. You know, genetics isn't as simple as adding A plus B and getting C. It's, it, genetics is, is something that it's scientific, you know, and it's just, you just got to keep working, and you got to pick out the genes that work in your place and try and reproduce them and, and continue to do that, and so, so that's what we do. Uh, this is probably one of the things that we sort of, this is our flagship. Like, we sell uh, between... 100 right, might be a little strong, but this year we actually have sold 130 cows since last August to other farms. 
uh, first, second, and third lactation cows, uh, fresh less than 60 days, and um, we've just had really, really good success. And I always say I like to have, I, I guarantee every cow that leaves my farm, when you, when you put her on your trailer, if you get her home to your place and something's not right, you give me a call and we're going to make it right. I got one cow back out of those 750, and she ended up classifying 85 points, and she's got a daughter that's going to be probably a, ex, or a very good two-year-old. And the complaint was she kicked. Cows kick once in a while. And I said, hey, if you're not happy, bring her back. I'll give you your money back. And, and uh, it actually was probably the cow that went the shortest distance, <laughs> which is kind of funny. It was a neighbor bought her. And uh, she came back, and they're, they're happy. I'm happy. We're all good. But, but I think as you're, as you're someone who stands by your genetics, you've you got to be honest. You've got to be truthful. If you try and you know, sell a cow with mastitis or sell a cow that's got a slow quarter or sell a cow that's got this or sell a cow that's got that, you're not going to sell a lot of cattle. But if you sell cattle that you represent that are good cattle that, the, again, the producer takes home and he makes money because it's a cow that's going to last in their operation, it's good for you, it's good for them. They tell their neighbors, they tell their friends. Right now I got a, a waiting list for cows and I guess we need to have more heifers because we uh, need to have, I got about, well actually I had an order the other day for 70 and I can't do 70. So we really like to do them in groups of 10. And so what I do is I kind of keep my barn always full and we sell 10 cows at a time and it just has really worked out. Uh, and then the last thing is embryos. Um, so we do embryo program, uh, five to seven cows a year, probably about 150 embryos that we're implanting. And uh, we've also sold embryos to, whoa, I got it. Okay, so this is our most famous cow. This is Toy Ann. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we always talk about is cows with one name. So there's a bunch of cows that we're going to go through here that have one name. And that's people all around the world recognize who those cows are. And so for us, that cow is Toy Ann. Uh, she's the dam of Toy Story and Lou. She's also the grand dam of Trump, the bull that's currently being marketed at Accelerated Genetics. And 40% uh, of the cows in our herd currently trace back to this cow. So um, there was never a day in her life that she got treated special. She had to go to the barn, go to the parlor, live in the free stalls just like every other cow. And um, that's one of the things that we kind of hang our hat on is nobody gets treated special. If you're going to be a good cow on our farm, you're going to be a good cow doing it the, like everybody else. So she did get a little special treatment at the end. Uh, we kept her for about three years after she was no longer milking, and then she got a box stall, but I think she earned that. So, uh, And then this is uh, one of our, her granddaughters. This is uh, the full sister to the Trump bull. She's 91 points. She has several bulls that are in AI. She has four daughters to date. Uh, several more pregnancies coming. Uh, she's made 40,000 four times. She's almost up to 200,000 lifetime. And just a cow that's really, really fun to work with and uh, been, a, been a great cow. This is her daughter, Tasia. Tasia is uh, one of our higher GTPI cows. And we're just getting ready to test a bunch of her offspring that we've made through IVF. And uh, we're pretty excited. She's actually pregnant and going to be calving again. And uh, so this is a, kind of that next generation cow. She really has a high genomic value for a planet for type, and she also has a high genomic value for fat. This is the highest scored member of the Toyan family. This is 2069, and uh, she's 92 points. Um, she uh, has several daughters in the herd, and uh, she's a cow that um, actually got hurt. Um, when she calved, she got hurt. We kept her in the bedding pack for uh, about 60 days. She uh, didn't, couldn't get up for a little bit of that, and we messed around with her and got, kept her going, and she now lives back in the barn, and she's 92 points, and I think uh, she's making a bunch of really nice stuff for us. This is a Gabor, so Gabor is kind of a bull that uh, has really earned a uh, good reputation the hard way. Uh, the daughters are really good. They milk a lot, and uh, he's an easy calving ease bull. Um, this is a, a daughter out of a Toy Story and then an amateur. And we have a lot of embryos that we've made out of this cow, and we've sold several of them. And she's a neat cow because there's no planet, Shadow, Goldwyn, Bolton, or what's the other bull? Old Man. Yeah. And uh, so I, you know, she's really a different kind of a genetic cow. So even though her genomic number isn't sky high for, for animals that fit into that category, she, she's pretty good that way. Uh, and then this is Desi. 
Uh, this is a cow I own with Kevin, and she's our highest scored cow. She's 94 points, and we thought we'd let you look at what she looks like in her working clothes. She just made 49,000 uh, and just short of 2,000 pounds of fat, and she's a real slow-moving cow. So that's the highest classified cow we've ever had. She's, she's 94 points. Uh, we have Goldwyn daughters out of her, and it was really unfortunate here. Um, we had some bad corn silage this year, as a lot of our neighbors did as well, and who knows what all the mycotoxin crap and stuff that was in it, but uh, two weeks before she was going to go dry, uh, she was carrying Atwood, twin Atwood heifer calves, and she aborted. So, and rather than be a cow that doesn't milk, she immediately decided she'd already calved again, and she's milking 145 pounds after being fresh a year. So she actually goes back to Della, the dam of Durham, so it's in the Durham family six generations back. This is Marva, again, a cow out of a one-name family, Lead May. A lot of you genetic people would know Lead May is a really famous cow, and there's a lot of pretty high genomic stuff. She's a Lauren, and there's probably some people that think Lauren you know, isn't maybe the greatest bull in the world, but he's, this, this is probably one of his best daughters. She's 92 points, max score is a three-year-old. She just calved again, and she's one of the favorite cows that I have. I uh, actually own her with David Sarbacher and Eric. That was an investment we made when the state Holstein convention was in, uh, back in Wisconsin, and Kevin owns her as well. This is Juba. This is Kevin's one-name cow. Uh, it's a cow that Kevin owned for a long time. Uh, there's 20 descendants of this cow on our farm, and uh, she's a 95-point Durham, one, a really wonderful cow, and her daughters just are really wonderful animals to work with. Classify high, milk well. Uh, Goldwyn Fate is actually a new cow that we bought. Um, I wanted to buy a Goldwyn. Goldwyn's, you know, this is a couple years ago. I wanted to buy a Goldwyn that was uh, sort of had all the homework done on her, and this cow we bought. And uh, she's flushed really well. I think we've made over 120 embryos out of this cow. Her first daughters have started to calve. We've sold bulls. We've sold embryos. I think embryos from her went to China. I think went to South America, several places. And her first two daughters are fresh on the dairy, and they're bookums, and they're really good cows. So we're excited about the rest of what she's going to have. Uh, this is Alana. Again, one named cows. Her dam, her grand dam is Ashlyn. So Ashlyn's one of the greatest show cows at the Dairy Expo ever. And we have a daughter by Lightning that's 92 points. And this is little Debbie. She's a Chief of Dean. Back to, she, I guess that's a two name, Chief of Dean. But uh, again, this is one of our favorite cows. She's excellent 90. Um, we flushed her a lot. For, until this last run, she was one of the top 50 GTPI type cows in the breed. And uh, just a wonderful cow to work with. We took her to our district show right out of the freestyle barn. She, she got third. We had never been halter broke before. but. She's a, she's a fun cow to work with. And then Apple, uh, another one named cow. We actually have a daughter, a Goldwyn daughter of Apple, who is the fourth highest red or red carry cow in the breed. And uh, she's a fresh Malkin two year old. And we're doing IVF on that heifer and getting some offspring out of her. But uh, we really like to have animals that uh, have a pedigree that people all over the world can walk onto your farm and say, I know that family. Um, now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the facility improvements we've had. Uh, one of the things we did when we built our dairy back in 1998, um, our free stalls when we built them were 46 inches wide and 8 feet long and all the really bad math that uh, was happening at that time. And um, we were lucky enough to get hooked up with Dr. Nigel Cook and Ken Nordland and their process of um, understanding what what a freestall barn should look like, what a stall should look like. And so we went back and we redid our barn and built it the way the kind of cows that we wanted to have needed to fit in. And so we widened the stalls. We actually took out our brisket boards because our stalls were too short and, and our cows have to share head space. Um, we also added 18 inches of lunge space on the outside, so we had to take and redo our curtains. You know, when curtains get to be 12 years old, they're starting to not be so good. So we added some... Uh, that 18 inches to the outside and allow our cows to lay straight in their stalls and be comfortable. And through all these processes, we've just, we always gain milk production. We always gain milk production when we make one of these changes. Um, we had a new calf barn, and we'll talk about that just a little bit later. And then we have, we also put some 
uh, pressure tubes in for ventilating our holding area. Uh, heat time is something we'll talk about in just a little bit. And the last uh, two things we've done, uh, three, we put in Laley Cattle Brushes two weeks ago. And they are like the most amazing thing I think I've ever put in. I just think that they're phenomenal. So we used to tail chalk. And I think it was Kev this was Kevin's idea. He'll get this one. <laughs> and uh, we always tail chalk. So tail chalk and cow brushes don't fit together, you know, because you're taking off your tail chalk. But now that we've used the heat time system, now we can use the, the brushes. And I really like the Laley's because they're in a small, they're small, they don't have the big swinging pendulum and they don't take up a lot of space. And if we went to our farm right now and actually did a real farm tour, Every one of those brushes would be running. They run all day long. The cows love them, and they are so clean. Our cows have cleaned. You know, some of the videos we show, the cows have some dirt on them. If we had the cow brushes in, you, if I could show you those pictures, and we probably should, uh, the difference is just amazing. Uh, the other thing we did, we started to direct load our milk. We're putting bays in, so we're loading directly into a semi. And we have a power magnet on our uh, mixer that James's idea. It's a rotating mixer that the feed, or a magnet that the feed has to flow through. And if, it's, uh, if there's a piece of metal in that feed, it's going to be caught. We had the sliding discharge tray, and we still have that. But the, that power magnet is just so powerful for our valuable cows to, to get a piece of wire that doesn't end up in their feed is really, really important. And it's, it, save one cow that that's paid for. So these are the positive pressure tubes. A lot of you are probably familiar with the pressure tubes for uh, heifers. Uh, a lot of the calf barns have been retrofitted. Well, we actually did this in our holding area. And we have 30-inch fans that have 10,000 CFM, and they blow the air in and down as opposed to across. So, so we're blowing that air down in between our cows. The air in this building is changing every 70 seconds now during the, winter, or during the summertime. And I think it was a really valuable investment for hot weather. And the temperature in here is always about four degrees colder than it is in the freestyle barn. And the humidity is a lot less. So those two combinations, usually that's a really humid sort of place on the farm, and we tried to help it be a little better. Okay, this is going to be a, a part of our calf barn. Uh, we built a brand new calf barn, and it likes to freeze up right there. Okay, um, one of the things... Uh, Mike Van Omberg is a person a lot of you probably heard of from Cornell, and he talks about calves and accelerated calf growth and all those programs. And one of the numbers that he said the, re the last time that I heard him talk was you want uh, your, your first calf heifers to be 82% of their mature weight when they calve. Well, if you do the math and have cows that are, you know, 15, well, 15, if you have 17, 1,800-pound mature cows that are... Uh, you know, fifth and sixth lactation. If you do the math back to those, that's a 1,300-pound heifer after she has her calf. And I think if, you, if, if people are really honest with themselves what their first lactation animals weigh, they're a lot less than that. They really are, especially if you calve them at 22 months. And so you really can't miss a beat trying to get those heifers to be big enough to calve at 22 months. Because a lot of people calve at 22 months. I just don't think they calve... 1,300 pound heifers at 22 month. And so we built this calf barn. As part of this calf barn, we also have a scale now that we're weighing our heifers and um, we're getting upwards of uh, two and a half to even three pounds of growth per day. And if you do the math on, you know, work back from 22 months and start with an 80 pound calf, to get to that, you gotta have two and a half pounds of growth every day of that heifer's life to get them calved in by 22 months. So. Uh, this has been a really good addition. Before that, we had heifers in about six different barns, and everybody will tell you doing chores wasn't.